What's going on guys? The following episode is with Brandon Arvani of Meow. In this conversation, we talk about treasury management, Bitcoin, yield generation, regulation, and much more. I really enjoyed this conversation with Brandon. And I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Don't forget that these episodes are brought to you by FTX US. You can click on the link in the description to learn more. Let's get in this conversation with Brandon and I hope that you guys enjoy it. Brandon, welcome back. How are you? Thanks, Pomp. Doing great. Great to be back. Uh, you guys raised a lot of money. Why, yeah. why do you need so much money? We, we're kind of going for it all here. Like we're not just going for yields. Okay. Right now, businesses can sign up with us and earn up to 4% potential yields. We have a conservative yield offering we always have. But phase two of the company is why we raise the money. That's not the end all be all. We're going for the entire corporate finance stack. And we think it can fundamentally be done better when built on crypto rails, but without making that clear to the end user. Okay. What, what is corporate finance for those that don't know? Like explain, is that just like counting, hey, how much revenue we have and what our expenses are? Or what, what does that entail? Sure, yeah. Specifically things like invoicing, things like treasury management, things like spend ultimately. Uh, Forex is a big one. But these are like the practical use cases of crypto, not the cosmic brain things. Like anyone could pitch anything in 2021 and get funding. Correct. We're, we come from the ground floor of an exchange. So we know what actually like people need. And that's kind of what we're going for. And that's what the money's going to be used for. So people uh, so far... Uh, until recently, they come to Meow, which yeah. I'm saying it correctly, right? Uh, <laughs> is um, uh, and they look for treasury management, like yield generation, meaning that rather than have cash sit in the bank at whatever bank and earn 0.03 percent, I think is the average uh, in a uh, in a deposit account, uh, they can come to you and earn up to four yeah. percent. Where does that yield come from? Yeah, so that's a great question. So how we've done things differently from day one, and this is back when we started in April of last year, 2021. We made it so that the customers actually had to pick exactly where their funds went. So it's not like a black box. You give the money and it says, all right, we'll give you an interest rate. They have to pick. Do they want it to go to an institutional lending desk like Genesis? Do they want it to go to this desk? Do they want it to go to a DeFi protocol? Their money goes exactly where they want it to. And we also only face accredited investors. So we don't face retail. So those are the two, two differences for us. But it was mostly, it is mostly institutional lending desks that traditionally lend to crypto hedge funds, et cetera. So when I run a business, let's say I'm the CFO at some large corporation, yeah. I'm staring at you know tens of millions of dollars sitting on our balance sheet. Uh, I'm like, damn, we're getting crushed with inflation. I want to earn a little bit more yield. Uh, I come to the platform and I'm able to pick who the counterparty is yeah. in the sense of the actual lending desk. Uh, and there's a, a yield that is associated with that. Yeah. Um, what kind of diligence can I do? Or like, how do I decide, right? If there's 10 different options or five different options, like how do I, as just a regular CFO that doesn't know that much about crypto know who to go with yeah so it's kind of painful for us but we have to write like 30 pages of like the risk profile of everything uh and explaining exactly what could go wrong with everything and we get on calls with all of our customers and we make sure they understand the risks fully uh we send them documents we send agreements and when they are accredited and when they understand the risk profile of these offerings uh they pick what makes sense for them some corporates like to do pretty aggressive high yield stuff you know ranging in like six seven percent now, we never dabbled in the 20% stuff that a lot of the retail apps did. That just didn't add up to us. Like, that was sketchy from day one to us. But we hit, we definitely curate uh, to some extent, but it's ultimately up to the, the investor. Yeah. So 4% sounds a lot closer to uh, what you'd see in the traditional world than there was people running around offering 10, 11, 12, 13 yeah. crazy numbers. Uh, why did those high numbers sound so risky? And, and what is your analysis as to what people were doing there uh, that you guys don't do? Yeah, it's a great question. So Unfortunately, retail only competes on one vector. So retail yield apps, for example, it's, it's the rate. And retail investors tend to be uninformed, and that's why they go after the highest rate possible. And so one retail app would be offering 10%, and then the next one would try to one-up them and say, we offer 12. And that would keep going and going and going. And the only way to do that in the crypto world was through the anchor protocol. That was UST. So pretty much all these retail apps, or, or the vast majority of them, were taking people's cash converting it to UST, putting it into the anchor protocol, which as you know, UST blew up and giving a dollar liability to their end users. So even though the interest in the anchor protocol went back to the asset that was UST, the yield app was saying, we're gonna pay you in dollars. So that was where the mismatch came. And when UST lost its peg and it went to zero, that's why they lost a lot of money. So those were the incentives for retail. Corporates is a totally different story. They care about being conservative. They care about like, you know, risk reward, they care about understanding the risk profiles. But that's why retail apps got in a lot of trouble uh, this time around. Now, not all of them, but most of them. Most of them. Yeah. When you look at the corporate finance world today, uh, of your customers, what percentage of their balance sheets are they putting in? I'm, I'm assuming it's mostly stable coins, maybe it's other things. Um, but what, what is the percentage that is exposed to kind of yield generation uh, in this new financial system versus uh, staying in the old financial system? 
Yeah, so it's mostly like something like 10 to 20% of their balance sheets that they put with us are excess cash they weren't planning on, on spending, um, anytime soon at least. And they deal with dollars. They don't need to own a wallet to come with us. They, they go and they transfer this from their bank account like they would an ACH or a wire. Okay. And it's mostly Web2 companies. You know, uh, That's what we're very proud of. That's why we were able to get a Series A done is because we proved that Web2 companies want a compliant bridge to these yield sources. Are you able to name any of the companies publicly? There are some testimonials on our site. Uh, those are the ones that I'd be able to. Um, uh, Alt is, a, is an example of that. Um, yeah, and the site has some other ones, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when you see this, talk a little bit more about uh, I sitting there as a CFO, yeah. I've got this cash, I basically just ACH you. What is like technically happening for me to then get uh, exposure to this as a corporation? So we have the relationship with the different lending desks. We have the bridge to a DeFi protocol if you'd like to do that. Our team is some of the founding engineers at, at Gemini. Uh, so we built the, the rails to convert your dollars to the stable coin, put it into the DeFi protocol if you pick that. Uh, but if it's an institutional lending desk, we have an incentive rate from them, and we just need to take your dollars and batch it with other people's and send it to that desk and pass you through the potential rate that you're earning. So from your perspective, it's one bank transfer, you're done. You see your interest accrue daily, um, you know, compounding yields, and you can withdraw in one to three business days in almost every offering that we have. So what's interesting about this is if you go back to the late 90s, uh, internet company, internet company, yeah. internet company, that's all anyone wanted to talk about. Now it's just companies, yeah. right? And, and quote, unquote, the internet, uh, one the retail users got normalized to it. So if I want an answer, I go to the internet. If I want to do something, I go to the internet, right? right. Uh, but two is also uh, the user experiences, the user interfaces have uh, kind of abstracted away a lot of the technical components. A simple example being uh, IP addresses, now there's human readable domains, yep. uh, and many, many others. Um, how important is it for all these different rails and all these different technologies that are being built today, which most people in the industry talk about, they, they kind of wave around, they say, look how shiny and, and innovative this is, look how cool it is, look what I made the technology do, yeah. versus no, that's all going to go in the background. And you know, 10 years from now, when true mass adoption is occurring, uh, people will have no clue what we're talking about. Yeah, abstracting everything away is the right answer right now. Historically, the, the companies with that make real money in the crypto space have been a bridge to the, you know, the IP of crypto effectively. So Coinbase was a bridge, OpenSea is a bridge, et cetera. And that's what we are. Uh, it's mostly been speculation to date, uh, frankly, you know, Coinbase and OpenSea and things like that. But I think stable coins are going to be pretty much the first use case that is not fully speculative. I mean, it is a superior payment rail to ACH or wire, especially when, when going internationally. And we want to be the first company that provides access to businesses as easy as you know, their existing payment rails. So they think they're sending a dollar effectively and it's really going uh, to a contractor. It's, it's, it's as seamless as sending a, a bank transfer right now. Yeah, how much money did you guys raise? We raised 22 million. So. 22, 22 million, and when did you raise the money? Uh, just a month ago, actually. Okay, so uh, you fundraised during a market downturn. Yeah. What, what was that process like and how did it differ from when you raised, I think in 2021? Yeah, 2021, like literally anyone, you say you're Web3, it's over. Like, here's your money. Like, <laughs> any company could do that. The thing that allowed us to raise in this market, which was egregious, by the way, was the fact that we had revenue. So we were built on fundamentals. We were very close to being profitable. Uh, if we didn't have revenue, it would have been a very different story. No one was pitching on narrative right now. No one's getting deals right now, period. Like it, This month to the, the previous month is, is night and day. That month to the previous one is, is night and day. But fundamentals are very important to us, having revenue, being lean. We're only nine people. Um, yeah, that that's really what how everything's changed. Everyone cares about revenue. And what about the actual fundraising process? Did you have to go talk to like two or three times more investors? Was it just, no, we knew who we wanted as investors and, and the conversation was different? Yeah, we were thrilled with Tiger uh, very early. I mean, the, the process took about a week um, and there was intense diligence. And we had, you know, we had multiple term sheets, for, which we're very grateful for. Really, really good people, but- Oh yeah, people competing. Yeah, yeah ultimately. Uh, Tiger was was clearly like, you know, we, we were so thrilled. I mean, they're no nonsense. They do intense diligence, just so professional and all this. Um, yeah, we're very happy with them. What was the diligence process? Like, like when you, intense is a unique word to use during a diligence process. And what was so intense? Yeah, so about? I mean, this is no joke. I mean, compliance is a big consideration now because a lot of the, you know, a lot of the yield apps are, are facing that scrutiny. We, we've been built compliance first from day one. Um, so explaining that story clearly with our lawyers, with, with uh, counsel on the other end. And uh, there's a lot of, I mean, they, they make phone calls to people uh, 10 years in your past <laughs> in the diligence. So, uh, but yeah, we're, so we're you're calling like uh, old high school buddies and stuff. Yeah, feasibly. I, I don't know exactly <laughs> who it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. All right. And now talk to me about uh, outside of just the treasury management, you mentioned kind of all corporate finance yeah. functions. So things like invoicing, like how, how do you think about uh, where invoicing kind of uh, intersects with this like brand new financial world? 
But yeah, you know the 24-7 nature of like stable coins, low fee. That's just practical, right? I mean, this is like really the first non-speculative use case for crypto, besides Bitcoin being the greatest store of value in history, in my opinion. Um, that's pretty powerful. Um, and things like contractors oversee, I mean, they prefer stable coins already. If they can get their hands on a stable coin, that's, that's what they want to do. People in Argentina, for example, the inflation is 20%. Um, they want to hold dollars. And it's a nightmare trying to get a bank account or, or hold dollars. Mm. So that's what we're focusing on is... Uh, international payments. We think foreign exchange is really interesting as well. Um, and basically, we have the fundamental thesis that corporates and crypto is a very inevitable convergence. And if we build practical rails for them, that's it's you know every every corporate's going to want to use us instead of their traditional bank account. Ultimately, when you yeah. say foreign exchange, uh, that's something that uh, I think in crypto most people just say uh, either I'm in like the crypto universe or I'm in the Bitcoin universe. Uh, there's really not any exchange between those two assets. Um, how do you think about foreign exchange and like what you guys can do for corporations? So Circle just came out with a Euro stablecoin as well, right? And the markets are nowhere near as deep as traditional finance. For, for, Forex is you know, very deep for the major currencies. Uh, but feasibly, if they get as deep, uh, the, the trading pools, for example, between like USDC, USD Euro, then you have a more efficient system. Anything done on chain involves less pen and paper, less transaction costs, 24-7, you know, weekends, you can have your money. Um, we definitely see that happening. I mean, DeFi definitely proved that it works in this downturn. They were the ones who got paid first. <laughs> you know, they were senior on everything uh, from all the all the crashes. So, we Expl Explain that more. Like, uh, there's centralized finance, there's decentralized finance. Uh, you said that DeFi works and yeah. they got paid first. What do you mean? Yeah, so some of the people who pause withdrawals, for example, um, they had... And they, they were borrowing from DeFi protocols. And if they didn't pay back those loans, they would have had their collateral liquidated. Now in CFI, there's things like bank, bankruptcy, there's cronyism, there's favoritism, et cetera. DeFi protocols are dumb in the best way. They're dumb in the best way, which means you can't call someone. You get liquidated. If you don't actually you know, pay your interest, pay your loan back, it's over. And that's what you actually saw on chain. There was no nonsense with them. Uh, so that's product market fit. I mean, there's no question about people rehypothecating or repledging collateral in two different places. For example, it's it's just you give the collateral in the form of Bitcoin to a DeFi protocol or, or ETH, and you have to pay or you get liquidated. And that was that transparency was so key in downturns like this. When I hear people say that DeFi worked mm -hmm. uh, and CFI didn't, uh, I think that it's probably too much of a, like a reductionist uh, perspective of like uh, obviously Luna, UST, you know, those uh, that kind of ecosystem did not work. Uh, and then obviously on the centralized uh, side, there's company, you know, take a Coinbase, right? Yeah. Zero issue, all, all of that. So how do you think about C5 versus DeFi given what we've watched play out over the last, you know, three, four months? So DeFi, I think, is very good at over collateralized lending and borrowing because it can automate a lot of that. That's not a giant market, though. Um Ultimately, if, if more of this kind of lending activity takes place on chain, it's more efficient and it's at lower cost. Um, so this world of kind of CDFI is coming out, which is really CFI, but on chain. Uh, there are protocols like Maple Finance, for example, that are, that are doing that. And when you have these protocols on chain, you avoid pen and paper, you avoid telegram chats, you avoid a, a lot of the issues. So there is certainly a place for both. DeFi is doing very well and over collateralized right now. Under collateralized is a different story. Uh, I've seen people pitching under collateralized on-chain lending. Yeah. Is, is that possible? And what are your thoughts in terms of how viable that will be uh, in the DeFi world, but without the over collateralization? It's extremely hard and it's not viable. Like it, it's in the long run, it probably is. But what is missing is the regulatory aspect. I mean, if someone doesn't pay you unsecured, uh, you have to go to court ultimately. You, know, you don't have my collateral if, if that happens. And so you need... We don't have, you know, police forces. We don't have court systems on chain right now. And there's no concept of credit scores uh, on chain. So that's why collateral is king on chain. That's why over collateralized lending is, is the first kind of lending that takes place on chain. So when you have these kind of court systems on chain or, you know, regulatory bodies that recognize that this is a loan on chain and they come in and intervene, that's how you can do, you know, unsecured lending or credit scores on chain. You just said collateral is king. Uh, when the finance world of Wall Street kind of traditional system sees collateral is king on chain, why don't they all just run and be like, oh my God, we'll never lose money as long as we have over collateralized lending on chain? Yeah, I mean, because it's a very small market. That's not the point of credit in, in most cases. It's, it's mostly, when you do collateralized lending, it's mostly for you know, traders and there's margin lending and stuff like that. But that's nowhere near, I mean, the entire financial system runs on unsecured lending. Now, getting that on chain is going to be a, it's going to be a longer process than most people uh, want to admit, but the over collateralized part is work is running like a clock and that's what we should be grateful for.
Can you decentralize unsecured lending in the sense where reputation, credit scores, like all these things that we know uh, the centralized system relies on, whether they work perfectly or not, like that is how the centralized system works. Uh, if you look at something like Bitcoin, the whole idea is that, hey, we can build these banks uh, without rehypothecation. We can, we can essentially go back to uh, kind of a, a strong financial system that isn't built on this huge credit component. Yep. Is the idea of bringing unsecured lending to uh, the DeFi or, or like on-chain uh, world, just trying to recreate some of the problems from the legacy system in, in the new world? Or like, how do, you, how do you just think through what are the pros and cons of doing that? Look, unsecured lending is going to take place whether it's, you know, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's ETH, whether it's dollars. Uh, it can be done more efficiently when you have an, basically an open API, like a compatible API everywhere, which is on-chain. So it's going to happen whether whether we believe in it or like it or not. Um, and yeah, like things like decentralized credit scores and stuff, that's, I mean, it could be the case. We have big problems with like oracles right now. The truth is what we need is in, like what you would want is enforcement if someone doesn't pay you back. And there's no way to enforce it on chain currently. You need like someone to hold you accountable, a court system or something like that. And we're a long way from that, uh, obviously. One of the uh, sayings in uh, the Bitcoin crypto world is uh, code is law. Mm -hmm. And to a degree, as you said, collateral is king on chain. And so the code is the law yeah, exactly. in that scenario. Exactly. Uh, yeah. As we get more of these uh, kind of recreation of the traditional world, like unsecured lending and, and many others, uh, will some of the thought process around something like code is law change? Or is it just somebody has to figure out how do you take the law and actually codify it so that it's enforced on chain? That's a very good question. Um, I think the code is law thing is its own, it's its own kind of saying, and it's a great saying. And that's why Bitcoin is like so solid. You know, there's only going to be 21 million of them. Um, and then, yeah, for unsecured lending, it's regulatory bodies written on paper is law as we have with the traditional financial system. So you're exactly right. Um, it's very different. Uh, they're yeah. two different kinds of law. Yeah. When I think of the decentralized financial world, I, I've said now for months, maybe even years, uh, that it's not about decentralized finance, in my opinion. It's about automated finance. And mm -hmm. the reason why is yeah. some of it will be centralized, some of it will be decentralized. Uh, you could look at, um, I'll, uh, I'll use USDC uh, as an example. Second largest stable coin, uh, based on last time I looked. Uh, they have centralization. They are not a decentralized yeah. stable coin, right? Um, but the technology is definitely superior to the legacy financial system. Yeah. And so when you look at that, is that considered DeFi? Or is that like this, you know, I call it automated finance because yeah. now you can actually use economic value uh, stably backed by a dollar right. and tr and use it across the world in an automated fashion, but it's not decentralized. Yep, you're exactly right. Yeah, I was using the word efficient. You're using the word automated. It's exactly right. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, there's the hard assets like Bitcoin, then there's the efficiency automated aspect of the centralized world, and you can cut so many costs. I mean, the internet, what it did for efficiency, if the internet was really just an efficiency improvement at the end of the day, Right. So like, I, I don't love the internet web three comparisons necessarily, but the efficiency improvements from kind of the crypto world is going to change the world as well, just from the efficiency imp improvements, not because we're recreating what government is or think like we have more data on what government is than anything in the world. It's the efficiency automation that is extremely, extremely valuable. B the Bitcoin world would argue uh, decentralization is really important for security. Obviously, Bitcoin is the most decentralized uh, network in the world. It's the most uh, secure computer network in the world. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it has proven to be a fantastic store of value over a long period of time, yeah. uh, you know, decade plus. Um, most of the other components of the industry, they talk about decentralization. Mm. Uh, if you go and talk to regulators, they they have this concept of a dyno decentralized in name only. Uh, there's uh, an idea within the community of like a spectrum of decentralization. It starts out centralized and eventually will, will become decentralized. But it sounds like you're actually making a different argument, which is like maybe the ultimate goal of some of this technology is not decentralization uh, because the security component of it isn't nearly as important as the efficiency. Like if you think of those two as a trade-off, so you get security or you get efficiency at the layer one, it sounds like you're making you no know, the efficiencies where there's tons of value to unlock. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a ton of value to decentralize the U.S. dollar. If people want to send U.S. dollars, they could do it more uh, more effectively. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that. We've seen people try to do yes. that before. Uh, but yeah, for the Bitcoin world, that is the most important thing. Decentralization is king. Like we're protect Bitcoin is just a child safety lock. We're protecting ourselves from ourselves, and that's why it exists, and that's why it's going to be a tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollar asset. Uh, but for the U.S. dollar, I mean, businesses want to send U.S. dollars places. Like that's the world we live in currently, and you have a way more efficient way to do it. There's no need to be cosmic brained about this. I mean, a dollar is a dollar. There's going to be centralization on the back end. Now, if that entire 
and a regime is going to fall, that's a different conversation. But yeah, there's no need to decentralize. I mean, you just need reliable kind of proof of reserves. You need an easy on, on ramp for that. And you get more people involved in the ecosystem. That's good for Bitcoin ultimately, which is the decentralized store of value that we have. You mentioned that Bitcoin is a child safety lock. What does Bitcoin as a child safety lock mean? It, it's, you know, it's, it's just there's a fixed money supply in Bitcoin and we can't bring ourselves to do that. It's like that scene in Limitless where he says, oh, you know, there's no, there's no safeguards for human nature. You know, why don't we just like crack a beer and live off the interest? We can't do that. Uh, that's, that's the innovation of Bitcoin is we are preventing ourselves from inflating the currency. There's no way to change the currency value. Um, that is a child safety lock and that's why it's valuable. It's just protecting humanity from its, its worst inclinations. So I think you, myself, many people who are watching this, they get that. Do yeah. the corporations yet understand this or are they so focused on efficiency and, and the kind of the conservative approach to their balance sheets that that is a, a, a secondary thought they may have later, but right now they're just focused on dollars. The truth, I would love to have a company that like 24 seven focuses on Bitcoin and the balance sheet, but it wouldn't be much of a company. Like we wouldn't do a series A. We have that as an option. We kind of, you know, nudge people like, Hey, I, I, <laughs> Bitcoin's great. Right. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to do our part there just to be clear. But what they care about is 24 seven settlement right now of us dollars, low fee transacting, uh, things they can't get from Fedwire and ACH, things they can't get from their legacy bank accounts. So we are at now, we believe we've built a better solution for them. And that's largely on the us dollar rails with the ability to buy Bitcoin seamlessly from that same account. What about things like payroll? Like one of the big mm -hmm. problems in uh, the legacy financial system is that people only get paid uh, every other week, yep. uh, so, you know, uh, twice a month uh, or once a month. And there's tons and tons of studies that show, uh, I think it was in 2019, top four banks made like $8 billion mm -hmm. of overdraft fees. Yep. And when you go and you actually analyze those overdraft fees, in many cases, it's not that the people don't have the money, it's that uh, their grocery bill came in on the 12th, then their car uh, payment came in on the 13th, Netflix hits yep. on the 14th, bam, they get paid on the 15th, yep. but they actually overdrafted on the 13th and 14th because the, the paycheck hadn't hit right. yet. And so if we were simply able to pay people at the end of every day, it would drastically eliminate one, the overdraft fees and, and that kind of whole part of the, of the legacy banking system. But also two is it would give people more economic freedom and flexibility. And so certainly. is that something that stable coins or kind of these crypto rails could help solve? Yeah, certainly. You can't really do that in legacy finance. I mean, it's not, it's not a good UX. Things like layer twos can help with that. Right now, the gas is too high to do like micro, micro transactions on a fraction of a USDC. Um, but things like layer twos can help and you can even do that, you know, partially in a database, partially on chain. Uh, but yeah, you're certainly right. That's a, that's a real use case. Like when we talk about real use cases, I think stable coins are dominating for legacy finance. Uh, stable coins are, are king and we, th we see their adoption about to blow up in a good way. And I think that's ultimately very, very good for Bitcoin. I mean, it gets everyone thinking about this space and they start thinking, okay, this is how I'm using my payment rails. There's a much easier way to buy Bitcoin now with this. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we, where we plug into that too. You mentioned that you guys only have nine employees. That's a small number compared to many other companies that we've seen, uh, both in the crypto ecosystem, but also uh, just in technology in general. Why do you only have nine employees and what the hell do they do? <laughs> my my co-founder says when everyone says it has a slightly uncomfortable amount of work, then you're at peak efficiency. And everyone's slightly uncomfortable with the amount of work we have. And that, it's very much the FTX model. I mean, FTX, there's rumors that there are 20 people. There's rumors that there are 60. I don't know exactly how many, but they punch above their weight. It's like, like 250 to 400. Is it really? Okay, so, that's, somewhere that's good to know. I like that. I like knowing. It's a, moving, it's a moving target. And I think that actually part of the beauty is that they don't want people to know. Yeah, because, exactly. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then everyone thinks they have 20 people. The lore is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you have things like automated infrastructure you can stand up and tear down in AWS. You have partners that eliminate the complexity. This is not like, it's much easier to build a company now than it was in 2004 when you'd have to build your own servers and bring them into your apartment or something like that. So if everyone's busy 24 seven, you got a very good system and that gets us to profitability. That gets us to a lot of things sooner. It's the only way to build a company right now, I think. Yeah. Uh, when you were out fundraising, what part of the business did people get most excited about? Was it the, what you've already built and kind of let's go scale this to the world? Or was it, okay, this is a great start. This will get people kind of onboarded and then let's go build out all the, the technology and services around it for the rest of corporate finance. Yeah, it was a little bit of both. What they got very excited about was compliance. No one was pitching compliance to them on the corporate treasury side. They got a lot of pitches. Uh, and the other thing that excited them was going after, you know, when I told them, you know, the treasury angle is very much a wedge to get into the entire corporate finance stack things like payroll, things like invoicing, things like spend. Um, that excites them because they know when you have a superior payment rail, lower cost one, you can pretty much beat all the incumbents, which are, you know, decacorns uh, on margin. You have a lower cost way to do things and you can pass those savings on to your customers. So um, 
Yeah, they were they were excited about that part for sure. When you guys go sell the product into some of these corporations, who's making the buy decisions? The CFOs, is it CEOs, is it a combination? Yeah, on the treasury side, if it's like a Series A company or earlier, it's very founder led. Now, when you get to Series B, Series C, the founder has sway, a lot of sway, but it comes down to the VP of Finance or, or CFO at that point. And the things that they care about are very different. So, at the seed and Series A level, they might like partially over collateralized offerings, and when you get you know into bigger companies, they want fully over collateralized. Like we have an offering where we have 150% collateral in Bitcoin against any dollars um, that we loan out. Uh, so that one has really good product market fit with like the Series B, Series C, et cetera. And when you start to think about uh, your process of selling, the company's name is Meow. That yeah. sounds insane, but also is memorable. Uh, why did you name it that? What was that process like? And then have you had anyone be like, we can't take you seriously because your name's Meow? Yeah, and you know, we had no business naming the parent entity Meow Technologies Inc. when we started out. That made it really hard to uh, get bank accounts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there's like an S-curve value to this name. We know what we're doing here. I mean, ultimately, it's a name that can be anything. It's a name that's in a high entr entropy space like the crypto world. You need to be able to be nimble. And it's kind of a burn the boats name. You know, like we have to succeed. Like there's no, it's not a hedge. Like we're telling everyone the name's Meow. And so we have to succeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's the idea there. And it's memorable and the shirts are soft. So that's... Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the plan <laughs> has anyone said anything any of the customers been like uh is this a real company or like you know it's the people who were actually turned off by it are the people who never would have been customers in the first place they're they're like the wall street people who wouldn't they like to pretend that they were you know oh they would have explored this but the name is meow i can't take it so they were never going to be a, like they're never open-minded enough to do this kind of thing yeah uh but no people like the brand and uh i think we've you know we've we have product market fit so i think we're past the uh the hard part now. So. How do you measure that you have product market fit? I mean, the, the revenue and the metrics, like in the bear market, like I don't think there's many funding around announcements in like June, May, obviously. So uh, that was based on solid fundamentals. Uh, we don't take that for granted. We, we care about the customer very much here. What, what are the metrics that you look at on like a day-to-day -day basis that you find most interesting? Things like AUM, things like, you know, our conservative kind of risk management approach, like protected all customer funds, like every single penny. We didn't lose a penny for, for customers in, in this downturn. Um, things like revenue, um, month over month growth. And, uh, yeah, now we get to now that we have like you know a lot of runway, the ability to scale out the team, we can do the more ambitious swings for pay and and spend. We have free USDC on our site, which a lot of companies don't have. What it's does pretty, that mean? It's like you can you can from your cash account, you can send USDC at no gas, no inter, like no two percent trading fee or something like that. And it's really just like Circle and Coinbase that have that. And we're Coinbase is a great company, but they're not targeting corporates. Yeah, they care about the top fifty institutions in the world, like the biggest fifty, like hedge funds, for example, and retail. Mm -hmm. So there's this corporate gap, which is just totally underserved in the market because no one thought it was a real market. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because retail is the early adopter to things. And you know, we come around and we, we say there's a corporate market. And that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're focusing on. And when you look at the customer base today, yeah. uh, do they start out with like 1% and then go to 2% and then 4% and 6 and like they're growing into it? Or do they just show up and they're like, hey, let's do 10%? Some people get their feet wet with like 5% of their treasury, et cetera, and they grow to like a... Uh, you know, 10, 20%. Some people like to go 60%. Uh, there is like a scaling up. There is like the build the trust relationship. And that's very important to us because we want to be around. We want to grow with them. That's why we also like serving startups that, you know, raise like 6 million, 7 million because we get to grow with them. Mm -hmm. When they do their subsequent raise, we're around as well. Um, yeah. And to be part of their picture of the treasury effectively. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned revenue. That's yeah. a wild concept uh, for some <laughs> folks to wrap their heads around. Um, I, I know. Uh, how do you guys make money? Uh, we're able to take, you know, the difference in, in the interest that we that we pass back. But ultimately, we we think it could be a SaaS play with with the suite of offerings that we have for corporates. Mm -hmm. And just yeah, we're we're gonna go head to head with the with the big with the big dog soon. I think. I mean, we. What does that mean? I think the decacorns call are, them out. Let's go. No, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> who are you going one. head to head with? I, I don't, I don't say <laughs> we're going like, to war. Let's know who the enemy <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> Things like Brex, for example. You know, like we one of our branding, like our, our value props, is like Web three Brex. That's kind of what we're going for. Um, why don't they do this? They're a great company, just to be clear. They're they're great. Um, we think we can make a wedge that is that is kind of Web three. You no, know, and they and they can. Uh, but we serve different markets to some some extent. We just want to be like head to head with these people. Um, and you know, I, th I think we have the wherewithal to do that. Got it. I'm an investor in Ramps. So it'd be nice to. Oh, Ramps. Yeah, they're yeah. both great companies. Yeah, Brasso. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. joking. <laughs> uh, when when you start to think about. Um, this market specifically, you mentioned regulation earlier. What needs to change in order for people to get more comfortable to actually start to use some of this technology? Uh, I think it'll happen. I don't think it'll, I think regulation won't come as quickly as everyone wants. I think there's a lot of pending lawsuits that, um, that 
the SEC, for example, wants to see resolved before they make a larger, you know, statement or, or make things super easy. Um, but I do think there should be a little bit more transparency in these CFI companies of what they're doing with the funds. Like the terms of service will say, oh, we kind of use Yearn, we kind of use uh, Yearn, and they're offering like 6%. And Yearn would be offering 1.2% at the time. So in our heads, when we saw that, we're like, what's going on here? Someone needs to keep these people accountable. You know, whether whether your ethos is that's like a regulatory body or it's like kind of pure policing, mm -hmm. um, there has to be more accountability, certainly. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what's your like 30 second pitch on anyone who's watching this that, uh, they say, Hey, I want to learn more about this. Who, who's it for? And what do you guys do? Yeah. If, if your business wants, you know, free access to USDC compliant way to buy and sell crypto and hold it or a compliant high yield strategy in, in dollars, uh, you can go to meow.co and sign up and we'd love to, we'd love to chat with you. That's the website. Me meow.co yeah. is, uh, is still the name, name cracks me up. <laughs> we have XYZ too. Meow.xyz. Yeah. That's like the web three things. So. Yeah. 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 No, the, the, uh, by the way, the guy who, uh, uh, I know a guy who had the dot co like domain mm. ending and, uh, that was the business was go convince everyone to buy dot co's and, uh, he targeted the startup world. That's why I took over in the startup world. He was yeah. explaining to me and he's like, yeah, I took a uh, dot co and I ran around and we went to accelerators and like all the stuff. We're like, Hey, you go try to buy the dot com, but the dot com's like, you know, expensive. Yeah. Instead, why don't you get the dot co and, uh, you want to know what the breakthrough for them was? What happened? Twitter deal. Really? If you ever see a shortened Twitter uh, URL, right. it's t.co. Interesting, yeah. And he's like, and then it exploded because if it's good enough for Twitter, right, then every That'll startup is like, hey, I, I guess I could use that too. .co is like Columbia, right? That's, I think that's what it comes what, from. What, yeah, 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 whatever it was, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. when you learn about how some of this stuff works, similar yeah. to you, you all, right? It's yeah. like it's one or two deals and then uh, exactly right. it's game on. Yeah, we don't need .com. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trust me, the guy or woman who owns meow.com yeah. is sitting there saying, somebody's going to pay me a lot yeah. of money for this one day. Yeah, we, we explored it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, how much was it? It was a million plus. It's not happening. A, mil a million dollars from meow.com? I don't know if I'm surprised that that it's over a million because that's high or low. I think it's like right around. We're like, yeah, but we're not going to do it. So yeah, they can. You know, if you guys want to play ball, you, you can do. <laughs> well, well, yeah. uh, I've seen people even do like a little equity exchange. Like, hey, rent it to us. We we we'll use uh, we we'll use it. We'll give you like you know. 50k 100k of equity and uh if we become the next facebook then like you're a genius if not then like you still own the domain we we, we wouldn't do that unfortunately you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i tried to help you yeah. uh all right where can we send people to find you on the internet yeah uh join me is our twitter handle check it out that's me it's my last name it's a killer it's arvanagi uh but join me as our handle we'd love to chat with you if you have any questions just talk to us uh we're happy to explain the space explain what we do um yeah if you need usdc or you need to you know high yield strategies for your treasury um uh, yeah, we'd love to chat. chat. Arvanagi? Arvanagi, yeah. I, you know how many times I've said your last name and I never said it right? Have you actually said my name? It's always Brandon. This yeah. is Brandon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because I, <laughs> Look, I yeah. listen, yeah. here's a secret. Yeah. If I see a last name I don't know, he, I'm not even. First, name. Yeah. Okay. For, first rule of content is don't make a fool of yourself <laughs> by trying to pronounce people's last names. Uh, last question for you is uh, given the bear market, sleep schedule, has it changed at all since last time? One of the sponsors is eight sleep. I slept eight and a half hours last yeah. night, so I feel like a fucking boss right now. What, what's your sleep schedule changes uh, in bull or bear market? Yeah, no, bear market's quieter. I guess you sleep longer. Eight sleep, I have that too. So let me, yeah, it's a great, great product. Uh, you sleep longer during bear markets, so you're not as worried because you're like, oh, there's not so much noise. It's quieter, going. yeah. It's just no, it's not about worry or anything. It's just like quieter. You don't get as many like people like the the looky lose go away in the bear market. You know, there's there's that just, is true. It's just us again. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. like the the, it's the people who have been here and are exactly. going to be here in the future, exactly. not the. Uh, uh, we're both in Miami and, uh, what was, uh, art, art Basel, yeah. Basel, however yeah. you say it, Basel, uh, Basel, I, obviously I can't speak English. Um, but, uh, when that came to Miami yeah. and the like NFT crowd and all that, I literally was like, this is insane. You can't do it. Yeah. Th there was people with yacht parties and this party and that party and everything. And it's uh, just like, too much. Right. Yeah. We, we deserve the crowd. <laughs> we deserve it, this, pro yeah. this probably yeah. is not going to yeah. be sustainable. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, man. Thank you so much for doing congratulations on the fundraise Thanks, and uh, anyone who wants to go check it out, go to meow co and uh and learn more but i appreciate you coming on thanks a lot man. all right everyone i really hope that you enjoyed that episode i did these episodes are brought to you by ftx us you can go click on the link in the description to learn more ftx has super low trading fees sometimes as much as 85 percent cheaper than any of their competitors they also are introducing digital stock trading to their application what that means is you'll be able to trade stocks right next to where you trade cryptocurrencies those stocks will come with no transaction fees and no payment for order flow so you get much better pricing FTX continues to innovate in financial markets, and they are very quickly becoming one of the most important crypto exchanges in the world. Go check them out by clicking on the link in the description. 
and go create an account at FTX today. Hope you enjoy these interviews. We'll be back with more soon.